International broadcasting is broadcasting that is deliberately aimed at a foreign, rather than a domestic, audience. It usually is broadcast by means of longwave, mediumwave, or more usually, shortwave radio, but in recent years has also used direct satellite broadcasting and the Internet as means of reaching audiences. Although radio and television programs do travel outside national borders, in many cases reception by foreigners is accidental. However, for purposes of propaganda, transmitting religious beliefs, keeping in touch with colonies or expatriates, education, improving trade, increasing national prestige, or promoting tourism and goodwill, broadcasting services have operated external services since the 1920s. History International broadcasting, in a limited extent, began during World War I, when German and British stations broadcast press communiques using Morse code. With the severing of Germany's undersea cables, the wireless telegraph station in Nauen was the country's sole means of long-distance communication. The U.S. Navy Radio Service radio station in New Brunswick, Canada, transmitted the 14 points by wireless to Nauen in 1917. In turn, Nauen Station broadcast the news of the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm II on November 10, 1918. Topic: <inaudible> Origins. Guglielmo Marconi pioneered the use of shortwave radio for long-distance transmissions in the early 1920s. Using a system of parabolic reflector antennae, Marconi's assistant, Charles Samuel Franklin, rigged up a large antenna at Poldhu Wireless Station, Cornwall, running on 25 kilowatts of power. In June and July 1923, wireless transmissions were completed during nights on 97 meters from Poldhu to Marconi's yacht Eletra in the Cape Verde Islands. High-speed shortwave telegraphy circuits were then installed from London to Australia, India, South Africa and Canada as the main element of the Imperial Wireless Chain from 1926. The Dutch began conducting experiments in the shortwave frequencies in 1925 from Eindhoven. The radio station PCJJ began the first international broadcasting on March 11, 1927 with programs in Dutch for colonies in the Dutch West Indies and Dutch East Indies and in German, Spanish and English for the rest of the world. The popular Happy Station show was inaugurated in 1928. In 1927, Marconi also turned his attention toward long-distance broadcasting on shortwave. His first such broadcasts took place to commemorate Armistice Day in the same year. He continued running a regular international broadcast that was picked up around the world, with programming from the 2LO station, then run by the BBC. The success of this operation caught the BBC's attention, and rented out a shortwave transmitting station in Kelmsford, with the callsign G5SW, to Marconi. The BBC Empire Service was finally inaugurated on December 19, 1932, with transmissions aimed towards Australia and New Zealand. Topic. Expansion Other notable early international broadcasters included Vatican Radio February 12, 1931, Radio Moscow, the official service of the Soviet Union this has since been renamed the Voice of Russia, following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Clarence W. Jones started transmitting on Christmas Day, 1931 from Christian missionary radio station HCJB in Quito, Ecuador. Broadcasting in South Asia was launched in 1925 in Ceylon, Radio Ceylon, now the Sri Lanka Broadcasting Corporation is the oldest in the region. Shortwave broadcasting from now and in Germany to the USA, Central and South America, and the Far East began in 1926. A second station, Zizan, was added in 1931. In January 1932, the German Reichspost assumed control of the Nauen station and added to its shortwave and longwave capacity. Once Adolf Hitler assumed power in 1933, shortwave, under the Auslandsrundfunk foreign radio section, was regarded as a vital element of Nazi propaganda. German shortwave hours were increased from 2 hours a day to 18 per days, and eventually 12 languages were broadcast on a 24-hour basis, including English. A 100-kilowatt transmitter and antenna complex was built at Zizan, near Berlin. 
Specialty target programming to the United States began in 1933, to South Africa, South America, and East Asia in 1934, and South Asia and Central America in 1938. German propaganda was organized under Joseph Goebbels, and played a key role in the German annexation of Austria and the Munich Crisis of 1938. In 1936, the International Radio Union recognized Vatican Radio as a special case and authorized its broadcasting without any geographical limits. On December 25, 1937, a Telefunken 25 kW transmitter and two directional antennas were added. Vatican Radio broadcast over ten frequencies. During the Spanish Civil War, the nationalist forces received a powerful Telefunken transmitter as a gift of Nazi Germany to aid their propaganda efforts, and until 1943, Radio Nacional de España collaborated with the Axis powers to retransmit in Spanish news from the official radio stations of Germany and Italy. <laughs> World War II During the Second World War, Russian, German, British, and Italian international broadcasting services expanded. In 1942, the United States initiated its international broadcasting service, The Voice of America. In the Pacific Theater, General Douglas MacArthur used shortwave radio to keep in touch with the citizens of the Japanese-occupied Philippine Islands. Several announcers who became well known in their countries included British Union of Fascists member William Joyce, who was one of the two, Lord Ha Ha, S. Frenchman Paul Ferdonnet and Andre Olbrecht, called the Traitors of Radio Stuttgart, and Americans Frederick William Kaltenbach, Lord He Ha, and Mildred Gillers, one of the two announcers called Axis Sally. Listeners to German programs often tuned in for curiosity's sake. At one time, German radio had half a million listeners in the U.S., but most of them soon lost interest. Japan had Tokyo Rose, who broadcast Japanese propaganda in English, along with American music to help ensure listeners. During World War II, Vatican Radio's news broadcasts were banned in Germany. During the war, the radio service operated in four languages. The British launched Radio SEAC from Colombo, Ceylon, Sri Lanka during World War II. The station broadcast radio programs to the Allied armed forces across the region from their headquarters in Ceylon. Following the war and German partition, each Germany developed its own international broadcasting station, Deutsche Welle, using studios in Cologne, West Germany, and Radio Berlin International (RBI) in East Germany. RBI's broadcasts ceased shortly before the reunification of Germany on October 3, 1990, and Deutsche Welle took over its transmitters and frequencies. Topic: <inaudible> Cold War era. The Cold War led to increased international broadcasting and jamming as communist and non-communist states attempted to influence each other's domestic population. Some of the most prominent Western broadcasters were The Voice of America, the BBC World Service, and the covertly CIA-backed Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. The Soviet Union's most prominent service was Radio Moscow now the Voice of Russia and China used Radio Peking then Radio Beijing, now China Radio International. In addition to the U.S.-Soviet Cold War, the Chinese-Russian border dispute led to an increase of the numbers of transmitters aimed at the two nations, and the development of new techniques such as playing tapes backwards for reel-to-reel -reel recorders. West Germany resumed regular shortwave broadcasts using Deutsche Welle on May 3, 1953. Its Julek transmitter site began operation in 1956, with 11 100 kW Telefunken transmitters. The Wirtachel site was authorized in 1972 and began with four 500 kW transmitters. By 1989, there were 15 transmitters, four of which relayed the Voice of America. Meanwhile, in East Germany, the Nauen site began transmitting Radio DDR, later Radio Berlin International, on October 15, 1959. In addition to these states, international broadcast services grew in Europe and the Middle East. Under the presidency of Gamal Nasser, Egyptian transmitters covered the Arab world. Israel's service, Kol Yisrael, served both to present the Israeli point of view to the world and to serve the Jewish diaspora, particularly behind the Iron Curtain. 
Radio RSA, as part of the South African Broadcasting Corporation, was established in 1966 to promote the image of South Africa internationally and reduce criticism of apartheid. It continued in 1992, when the post-apartheid government renamed it Channel Africa. Ironically, the isolationist Albania under Enver Hoxha, virtually a hermit kingdom, became one of the most prolific international broadcasters during the latter decades of the Cold War, with Radio Tirana one of the top five broadcasters in terms of hours of programming produced. Estimated total program hours per week of some external broadcasters. Today. At the end of the Cold War, many international broadcasters cut back on hours and foreign languages broadcast, or re-emphasized other language services. For example, in 1984, Radio Canada International broadcast in English, French, German, Spanish, Czech, Slovak, Hungarian, Polish, Russian, and Ukrainian. In 2005, RCI broadcast in English, Chinese, Arabic, Russian, and Spanish. There is a bigger trend towards TV, e.g. BBC World News, NHK World, CCTV9, and news websites. Some services, such as Swiss Radio International, left shortwave altogether and exist in Internet form. In addition, new standards, such as Digital Radio Mondiale, are being introduced, as well as sending programs over the web to be played back later, as podcasts. International broadcasting using the traditional audio-only method will not cease any time soon due to its cost efficiencies. However, international broadcasting via television is considered more strategically important at least since the early 2000s. The BBC World Service was the first broadcaster to consider setting up a satellite television news and information channel as far back as 1976, but ceded being the first to CNN that had primary access to Canada soon after launch. The defunct BBC World Service Antigua Relay Station was built in 1976, but its setup costs were not known to have been part of the BBC WS decision processes at the time. In the early 1990s, many international as well as domestic 24-hour news and information channels launched as part of the post-Cold War prosperity bubble. There was another burst of global news channels launching in the late 2000s as part the developing world trying to catch up with the developed world in this area. Topic: <laughs> Reasons for international broadcasting. Broadcasters in one country have several reasons to reach out to an audience in other countries. The examples given below are not meant to be exhaustive, but are illustrative. One clear reason is for ideological, or propaganda reasons. Many government-owned stations portray their nation in a positive, non-threatening way. This could be to encourage business investment and or tourism to the nation. Another reason is to combat a negative image produced by other nations or internal dissidents, or insurgents. Radio RSA, the broadcasting arm of the apartheid South African government, is an example of this. A third reason is to promote the ideology of the broadcaster. For example, a program on Radio Moscow from the 1960s to the 1980s was What is Communism? A second reason is to advance a nation's foreign policy interests and agenda by disseminating its views on international affairs or on the events in particular parts of the world. During the Cold War the American Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty and Indian Radio Air were founded to broadcast news from behind the Iron Curtain that was otherwise being censored and promote dissent and occasionally, to disseminate disinformation. Currently the U.S. operates similar services aimed at Cuba and the People's Republic of China. The BBC World Service, The Voice of America, All India Radio and other Western broadcasters have emphasized news broadcasts, particularly to countries that are experiencing repression or civil unrest and whose populations are unable to obtain news from non-government sources. In the case of emergencies, a nation may broadcast special programs overseas to inform listeners what is occurring. During Iraqi missile strikes on Israel during the 1991 Gulf War, Coal Israel relayed its domestic service on its shortwave service. Besides ideological reasons, many stations are run by religious broadcasters and are used to provide religious education, religious music, or worship service programs. For example, Vatican Radio, established in 1931, broadcasts such programs. 
Another station, such as HCJB or Trans World Radio will carry brokered programming from evangelists. In the case of the broadcasting services of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, both governmental and religious programming is provided. Stations also broadcast to international audiences for cultural reasons. Often a station has an official mandate to keep expatriates in touch with the home country. Many broadcasters often relay their national domestic service on shortwave for that reason. Other reasons include teaching a foreign language, such as Radio Exterior de España's Spanish class, Un idioma sin fronteras, or the Voice of America's broadcasts in special English. In the case of major broadcasters such as the BBC World Service or Radio Australia, there is also an educational outreach. An additional reason for international broadcasting is to maintain contact with a country's citizens traveling abroad or expatriates who have emigrated and share news from home as well as cultural programming. This role of external shortwave broadcasting has declined as advances in communications have allowed expatriates to read news from home and listen and watch to domestic broadcasts in their own language via the Internet and satellite. A number of international services such as the original BBC Empire Service, Radio Netherlands, France's Post Colonial now Radio France International and others were founded in part with the goal of helping draw overseas empires closer to the mother country and provide closer cultural and communication connections between the home country and its colonies, a role that became largely obsolete due to decolonization. Notable networks CNN International English BBC World News Arabic English Persian BBC World Service Arabic Azeri Bengali Burmese Cantonese English French for Africa Hausa Hindi Indonesian Kinyarwanda Kurundi Kyrgyz Nepali Pashto Parian Portuguese for Brazil Russian Sinhala Somali Spanish for Latin America Swahili Tamil Turkish Ukrainian Urdu Uzbek Vietnamese DD News Hindi, English, Sanskrit, Punjabi, Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, Malawi, Urdu, Bangla, Marathi, Malayalam, Thai, Balak, Arabic, Fiji Hindi, Bhojpuri, Assami, Nagapur Asian News International Hindi, English, Tamil, Telugu, Bangla Sky News English, Arabic France 24 French, English, Arabic, Spanish Read Globo Portuguese, English Record TV Portuguese, English, Spanish Al Jazeera English, Arabic Telesur Spanish, Portuguese, English Deutsche Welle German, English, French, Arabic, Hindi, Spanish, and 27 other languages TRT Turkish, English, French, Arabic and 39 other languages PTI Hindi and 98 other languages Press TV English, French TV5 Monde French Z News Hindi RT Russian English French Arabic Spanish ZL Hindi Thai English Tamil Telugu and 126 other local languages Voice of Indonesia English French Spanish German Indonesian Japanese Arabic Chinese Hindi Australia Network English I24 News English French Arabic Sun TV Tamil NHK World Japan English Japanese CGTN English French Spanish Russian Arabic Ararang TV English Korean World as One News English SMNI English Filipino Ray Spanish, German, French, English, Italian, Portuguese, Chinese, Japanese, and formerly Arabic Republic English, French, Hindi, Tamil, Telugu, Bangla, Russian, Italian, Spanish, Nepali, Panama, Arabic, Hebrew Uni Hindi, English Topic. Means to reach an audience Because of this many broadcasters are discovering they can reach a wider audience through other methods particularly the internet and satellite television and are cutting back on or even entirely dropping shortwave. An international broadcaster has several options for reaching a foreign audience. 
If the foreign audience is near the broadcaster, high-power longwave and mediumwave stations can provide reliable coverage. If the foreign audience is more than 1,000 km away from the broadcaster, shortwave radio is reliable, but subject to interruption by adverse solar, geomagnetic conditions. An international broadcaster may use a local mediumwave or FM radio or television relay station in the target country or countries. An international broadcaster may use a local shortwave broadcaster as a relay station. Neighboring states, such as Israel and Jordan, may broadcast television programs to each other's viewing public. An international broadcaster, such as the BBC, Radio France International, or Germany's Deutsche Welle, may use all the above methods. Several international broadcasters, such as Swiss Radio International, have abandoned shortwave broadcasting altogether, relying on Internet transmissions only. Others, such as the BBC World Service, have abandoned shortwave transmissions to North America, relying on local relays, the Internet, and satellite transmissions. <laughs> Mediumwave and longwave broadcasts Most radio receivers in the world receive the medium wave band 530 kHz to 1710 kHz, which at night is capable of reliable reception from 150 to 2500 km distance from a transmitter. Medium wave is used heavily all over the world for international broadcasting on a formal and informal basis. In addition, many receivers used in Europe and Russia can receive the longwave broadcast band 150 to 280 kHz, which provides reliable long-distance communications over continental distances. Topic: <laughs> Shortwave broadcast Shortwave receivers are capable of receiving shortwave transmissions 2000 to 30000 kilohertz or 2 to 30 megahertz. Depending on time of day, season of year, solar weather and earth's geomagnetic field, a signal might reach around the world. In previous decades shortwave and sometimes high-powered medium wave transmission was regarded as the main and often the only way in which broadcasters could reach an international audience. In recent years the proliferation of technologies such as satellite broadcasting, the Internet, and rebroadcasts of programming on AM and FM within target nations has meant that this is no longer necessarily the case. Transmitter output power has increased since 1920. Higher transmitter powers do guarantee better reception in the target area. Higher transmitter power in most cases counteracts the lesser effects of jamming. 1950s, 100 kW 1960s 200 kilowatts early 1960s 2 by 100 kilowatts twinned 1970s 300 kilowatts but many 250 kilowatts transmitters sold 1980s 500 kilowatts sometimes transmitters were doubled up to produce 1000 kilowatts output 1980s present 600 kilowatts single 1200 kilowatts from twin transmitters international stations generally use special directional antennas to aim the signal toward the intended audience and increase the effective power in that direction use of such antennas for international broadcasting began in the mid 1930s and became prominent by the 1950s by using antennas which focus most of their energy in one direction, a modern station may achieve the equivalent, in that direction, of tens of millions of watts of radio power. <laughs> Digital audio broadcasting Some international broadcasters have become available via Digital Audio Broadcasting DAB in Europe in the 1990s, and in a similar limited way in the Americas via in-band FM IBOC DAB systems in the US in the 2000s. This is a popular method to reach listeners in cars that would otherwise not be accessible during that part of the day. However, in terms of the global international broadcasting audience the DAB listener base is very small. One can assume that it is less than 2% of the listener base globally. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Television. International broadcasting via 24-hour TV news channels has its origins in North America in the early 1980s. CNN technically was the first 24-hour international news channel as it was made available in Canada soon after launch. 
The BBC World Service considered setting up a global TV news channel as far back as 1975, but abandoned the idea for internal reasons. Notwithstanding a large number of international 24-hour television news and information broadcasters, the television percentage of viewers is still fairly small when compared to global radio listener numbers. The rural populations of Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, as well as East Asia have radio listener bases that are far larger than the largest international TV broadcaster could hope for, yet they could be considered underserved since the end of the Cold War when these regions had more radio broadcasts targeted at them. Topic. Streaming video sites Many international television broadcasters as well as domestic television broadcasters have set up accounts on streaming video sites like YouTube to allow their news and information broadcasts to be globally distributed. The viewer numbers for these sites may seem huge. Cable, TVRO and terrestrial television broadcasters probably have 100 to 1,000 times larger audiences for their international broadcasting content. International broadcasters known to maintain their own streaming video sites not authoritative. Al Jazeera English BBC World News CNN International DD News DW France 24 I24 News RT formerly known as Russia Today Sky News Wyan World as One News Topic RSS feeds and email Many international broadcasters television or radio can reach unreachable audiences via email and RSS feeds this is not at all unusual, as the first commonly agreed international broadcast was a Morse code telegram transmitted from U.S. President Wilson to the German Kaiser mid via a high-powered longwave transmitter on the U.S. East Coast this important event in international broadcasting history was described in depth in the IEEE, The History of International Broadcasting, first volume. As Morse code is considered to be a data format, with email and RSS merely being refinements of the technology it can be said that international broadcasting has a deep relationship with modern-day datacasting. The reach of RSS and email for international broadcasters is not really known that well, especially considering that emails get forwarded. The numbers for active RSS and email audiences are probably 5 to 20 times larger than for streaming video. It may take into the 2010s to get meaningful numbers with respect to the size of these audiences for assorted technical reasons related to the RSS and email technologies. Email and RSS feeds can traverse telecommunications barriers that streaming video cannot, thus the larger expected audience numbers. The global economic downturn of 2008-2009 will probably increase the email and RSS audience sizes as fewer people will be able to afford high-speed internet connections in North America, Western Europe and the Asia-Pacific regions. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners An international broadcaster may have the technical means of reaching a foreign audience, but unless the foreign audience has a reason to listen, the effectiveness of the broadcaster is in question. One of the most common foreign audiences consists of expatriates, who cannot listen to radio or watch television programs from home. Another common audience is radio hobbyists, who attempt to listen to as many countries as possible and obtain verification cards or letters QSLs. These audiences send letters and in response few radio stations write them back. These kind of listeners often take part in weekly and monthly quizzes and contests started by many radio stations. A third audience consists of journalists, government officials, and key businesspersons, who exert a disproportionate influence on a state's foreign or economic policy. A fourth, but less publicized audience, consists of intelligence officers and agents who monitor broadcasts for both open-source intelligence clues to the broadcasting state's policies and for hidden messages to foreign agents operating in the receiving country. The BBC started its monitoring service in Caversham, Reading in 1936 now BBC Monitoring. In the United States, the DNI Open Source Center formerly the Central Intelligence Agency's Foreign Broadcast Information Service provides the same service. 
Copies of OSC, FBIS reports can be found in many U.S. libraries that serve as government depositories. In addition, a number of hobbyists listen and report spook transmissions. Without these four audiences, international broadcasters face difficulty in getting funding. In 2001, for example, the BBC World Service stopped transmitting shortwave broadcasts to North America, and other international broadcasters, such as YLE Radio Finland, stopped certain foreign language programs. However, international broadcasting has been successful when a country does not provide programming wanted by a wide segment of the population. In the 1960s, when there was no BBC service playing rock and roll, Radio Television Luxembourg RTL broadcast rock and roll, including bands such as The Beatles, into the United Kingdom. Similar programming came from an unlicensed, or pirate, station, Radio Caroline, which broadcast from a ship in the international waters of the North Sea. Restricting reception In many cases, governments do not want their citizens listening to international broadcasters. In Nazi Germany, a major propaganda campaign, backed by law and prison sentences, attempted to discourage Germans from listening to such stations. The practice was made illegal in 1939. In addition, the German government sold a cheap, 76 Reichsmark People's Receiver as well as an even cheaper 35 Reichsmark receiver, that could not pick up distant signals well, the idea was copied by Stalin's Soviet Union, which had a nearly identical copy manufactured in the Tesla factory in Czechoslovakia. In North Korea, all receivers are sold with fixed frequencies, tuned to local stations. The most common method of preventing reception is jamming, or broadcasting a signal on the same frequencies as the international broadcaster. Germany jammed the BBC European service during the Second World War. Russian and Eastern European jammers were aimed against Radio Free Europe, other Western broadcasters, and against Chinese broadcasters during the nadir of Sino-Soviet relations. In 2002, the Cuban government jammed the Voice of America's Radio Marti program and the Chinese government jammed Radio Free Asia, Voice of America, Radio Taiwan International as well broadcasts made by adherents of Falun Gong. North Korea restricts most people to a single fixed frequency medium wave receiver, those who met political requirements and whose work absolutely required familiarity with events abroad were allowed shortwave receivers. Another method of reaching people with government radio programming, but not foreign programming, is the use of radio broadcasting by direct broadcasting to loudspeakers. David Jackson, director of The Voice of America, noted. The North Korean government doesn't jam us, but they try to keep people from listening through intimidation or worse. But people figure out ways to listen despite the odds. They're very resourceful." Yet another method of preventing reception involves moving a domestic station to the frequency used by the international broadcaster. During the Batista government of Cuba, and during the Castro years, Cuban medium wave stations broadcast on the frequencies of popular South Florida stations. In October 2002, Iraq changed frequencies of two stations to block the voice of America's Radio Sawa program. Jamming can be defeated by using very efficient transmitting antennas, carefully choosing the transmitted frequency, changing transmitted frequency often, using single sideband, and properly aiming the receiving antenna. For a list of international broadcasters, see List of international broadcasters. See also List of shortwave radio broadcasters Shortwave Shortwave bands Shortwave listening FTA receiver Mediumwave – MW broadcasts generally don't travel as far as shortwave broadcasts, but MW is still used for international broadcasting, particularly to neighboring countries MWDX Radio Y Television Marty Euronews <laughs>